Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and in knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. It's interesting to read this little bit of one of Paul's letters to the Corinthians. Because we know the rest of the story. Who was the, the news guy that used to say that? Oh, Paul, Paul Harvey. And now the rest of the story. Um, we know the rest of the story. We know that Corinth, the church in Corinth, was a church with serious problems. That their best intentions seemed always to go astray. The folk wanted to use the gifts that they believed God had given them for ministry, and that disintegrated into fighting over which gifts were the most important. And each of them argued that it was. My gift is more important than yours because if we didn't have someone who knew how to play piano, how in the world would we sing our songs? My gift is more important because what in the world would we come to church for if it wasn't for an amazing sermon that made you go home and cry because you just heard something that changed your life? Then no, no, no. The most important thing is someone knows how to arrange the table so it is beautiful. What would we do at communion if nobody had the bread there? And on and on it went. They wanted to grow in faith. They wanted to follow the teachings of an apostle who would inspire them, who, who would be in touch with God's yearnings for them and would have just the right thing to say at just the right time. And that disintegrated into arguing over which apostle was the best. Well, I'm a follower of Paul. He's a little rough around the edges sometimes, but Paul, Paul knows how amazing and revolutionary the gospel is. Well, I follow Apollos. He can preach up a storm. And he's not bad to look at either. And then there were even those who said, well, I don't listen to Paul or Apollos or James or anybody else because Jesus talks to me directly. And I hear from the source. Even their observance of the Lord's Supper became less than what it was supposed to be. In those days, when they had communion, they always had a full meal. And indeed, they did that every time they came together. They had a full meal and communion as part of that meal. Well, they lived in a time and a place where there were some people who worked from kin to kaint. And they did work from kin to kaint. And there were other people who lived off the sweat and blood of those who were working from kin to kaint, and they could go and show up whenever they wanted, so they did. They arrived at the communal meal early and ate all the food. And then when the poor folk who had been working and working and working had showed up, and there was nothing left for them to have. And of course, the wealthy who had no idea how the real world worked said, well, why didn't you come earlier? If you really wanted to share in the food, you should have been here when we arrived. It fell apart. 
And then there were the moral issues that came from the Greek and Roman societies, folk who lived very, very different lives than those who came out of the Jewish background. The church was a mess. And in many ways, that church was reflective of the city in which they found themselves. Corinth was a city that could have fit in pretty well with us today. We wouldn't be so out of kilter if we found ourselves there other than the fact that the technology was different. It was marked by crass individualism. People thought of themselves first, they put themselves first, they found, they felt as if they were in serious competition with others, and there was a win-lose mentality. Every interaction involved someone winning and someone losing, and they felt they lived in a world of scarcity. Indeed, they did leave, live in a world of scarcity, and so if someone is winning and losing, someone is going out. And by golly, it isn't going to be me. It was a major trade city. And that meant that there were folk there from all over the known world who interacted, who traded, who worked with and against each other, who tried to take advantage of each other. Now what was unusual in the ancient world is that in Corinth, there was some room to get ahead. There was some room for, for, for social movement. And so if you worked hard and you were lucky and maybe used some questionable tactics, it would pay off and you would find yourselves moving up the social ladder. At the same time, like in all of the ancient world, the classes were very separate. The wealthy did live off the sweat and blood of the poor, and they used their wealth to gain even more advantages over the poor, to get more out of them for themselves. And here, here was this city where cultures and religions and ethnic groups met and rubbed against each other, and then, at the end of the day, each retreated to their own spaces, where they felt comfortable with people who were like them. And then we have the church. The Corinthian church was made up of all of those different groups of people, every class, every social setting, every ethnic background, every religious background, every different understanding of the world, but instead of rubbing against each other and then going back to their separate corners, they found themselves staying together and trying to become this new community of faith. All of the tensions, all of the mistrust, all of the stereotypes, all of the misunderstandings from the outside world came into the church. And here they were, a bunch of folk who had come from all of these different backgrounds and had no understanding of what a church is supposed to be. They had no history with it. There was no history with it. Churches hadn't been around that long. No one could say, well, we always did it this way, because they didn't always do it at all. They had no seated pastor with a, with a seminary degree. They had no Bible to refer to. There were snippets of, of texts and letters that were traveling around. There were stories that they heard, but there was no way for them to judge which ones were authoritative and which ones weren't. Nobody had made that decision at that point. And so they would get all of these different stories about Jesus, some of which we would hear and shake our heads and say, that's not the Jesus I know. But they had no way to make that judgment. And then they had these different religious backgrounds that said, this is the way it works. No, this is the way it works. No, we have castes. No, we don't have castes. We all come together as equals. And they tried to figure all of that out together, and they were having a hard, hard time. 
The task before them was daunting, to become God's people in this new community that breaks down all of the barriers. And they had problems. They had serious problems. Some of the leaders were wise enough to see those issues and wrote to Paul, and Paul answered. We know that he answered three times, that we have at least three times. We have two of his letters in our Bible, and, and there's mention in there of, of yet a third one. So we know there were at least three letters that he wrote. So we know that the problems continued, and they were big enough that they had to come back to him more than once. And when he answers their questions, sometimes Paul answers with both barrels. If we read the rest of what we have to the Corinthians beyond the passage that we heard a few minutes ago, we would think this is one messed up church. If church theorists today were looking at it, they would be writing their predictions of when it would collapse. If we took this church to the seminaries, and indeed we do just that, it could be a case study on how not to do church. Indeed, if we read the rest of this, this book and asked each of us without knowing that it came from the Bible, is that a church you would go to? We'd all laugh and say, no. Are you kidding? Why would I put up with that? Why would I go to communion only to find out, why would I show up at the gathering only to see that someone had come earlier and eaten all of the food? <laughs> why would I do my work and try to share my gifts only to have someone else denigrate what I had done and tell everybody that what I contributed really wasn't very important? Why would I put up with that? It would be so easy to write off the Corinthian church. It would be so easy to look at them as, as a picture of dysfunctional Christianity, to shake our heads, to shake off our shoes and walk away. But a few minutes ago, I did read Paul's greeting to them. And we've seen something else. Now, it's true, scholars will tell us, that it was the convention of the day to begin every letter with thanksgiving for the recipient. And so we might think that this was just a, a pro forma beginning. That Paul wasn't serious when he gave thanks for the Corinthians. He was just filling in the blanks. I give thanks to you for blank. I have to say this because the letter starts that way. It's not very much different than a modern letter saying, Dear so-and-so. Now we'll get down to the real stuff. It would be understandable to read it in that way, but I have to say that every time I read it, it feels to me as if there is more there. That Paul seems really to have affection for these Corinthian Christians that he seems to have some degree of admiration for their pluckiness, that they're willing to get in there and duke it out when it is as hard as it is. He seems to have hope and faith for this messed up church. Because Paul knows, above all else, that God is at work in the Corinthian Christians. And we know above all else that God is good. All, all the time. time. And so it doesn't matter to Paul that the church is not perfect. It doesn't matter that they misuse and abuse their gifts. It doesn't matter that they're not always very clear about who they are supposed to be together. It, it doesn't matter that sometimes they allow the world's categories to derail the community that they are becoming. What matters to Paul is that God is at work there, that God has gifted them, that they are on a journey be to becoming the people God has called them to be, that God is at work in and through and with them. 
and that this future, though it is clouded in fog, that they don't quite see what it is, don't understand what it means, but still, it comes closer each day because God is at work. Paul has hope because God is strengthening them a little more each day. Paul has hope because God is keeping them. Paul has hope because God is leading them forward. Sometimes two steps forward and one step back. Maybe even sometimes two steps back and only one step forward. But overall, they are still moving. And Paul has faith that they will become the people they're supposed to be because God is there. My, one of my closest friends, um, and, and if you knew him, this would make sense. In his email signature, he always has a quote from Eeyore. <laughs> you know Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? One of, one of the ones that he had for a long, long time was, Eeyore said this, when stuck in a river, it's best to dive and swim to the bank yourself before someone drops a large stone on your chest in an attempt to hoosh you there. <laughs> if you remember Eeyore in Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore was always depressed. You're gonna want like this, and you talk like this. And whatever was going on, Eeyore had the ability to find the worst in it. Yeah. Eeyore could be our mascot as a culture these days. Depression is epidemic. Literally, it's epidemic. Today was the first time in a long time that I can remember that during our prayer time, we didn't mention someone who was depressed. And it wasn't because they weren't on our hearts, it's just that we didn't get them mentioned today. And indeed, it makes sense. There's a lot to be depressed about, isn't there? We could start with the personal stuff. We could then grow a little bit and get to the wider community, to the national stuff. Boy, by then the list is getting really, really, really wrong. Then we could get to the global stuff. And in the end, we would all be really, really depressed. And it would take a really, really long time. And unlike Eeyore, we don't even have to work to see the worst. If we just stand and wait a while and forget about it, some politician will very quickly stand up to remind us of all of the bad things that are going on. Some news person will list them. If you get the newspaper, that's pretty much all we see there. And if you don't hear either of those two things, you've got a preacher to tell you. <laughs> but Paul has good news. Now, it's dangerous whenever you read one of the letters and apply them, because Paul is speaking here to a specific church with a specific list of problems with specific needs. And, and they're not ours. But I think in this case, Paul's good news still applies. The work before us is daunting. The work before us is daunting because all of the anchors that most of us here have relied on in our lives need to be rebuilt. We have no institutions in our society that are trusted anymore. And at least in some of the cases, it's because they weren't tr trustworthy. Sometimes it's other than that, but, and it goes back to the 60s when that all started to fall apart. And we need to rebuild trustworthiness in our institutions, and we need to rebuild trust in our society. As a part of that, the church is no longer a moral authority, and that's been for some time. 
You know, we can all point at, at examples of that from the Roman Catholic Church and the pedophile priests to evangelicals in Alabama standing up and voting for a pedophile to the large, large numbers of white evangelicals who were able to completely ignore the moral failings of our current president and push him nonetheless. It, it, it goes on from there. But we as a church have to reclaim the higher ground. All of us in the church. And to speak with a strong voice. We live in a time when, when it's come to the place where facts don't matter. And, and when someone looks at a situation and speaks an untruth, they, they characterize that as, well, it's just alternative facts. Well, sometimes there might be alternative facts, but more often there aren't. There's just facts and not facts. And if we can't agree on that, where do we go? We need to reassert that. As a culture, we've come beyond caring about the common good. I've got mine. I want more. The rest of you really don't care. We still have a scarcity mindset, and that just feeds that lack of caring about the common good. And even our leaders seem to be putting themselves above the nation. One news source that I read this past week is calling our government now a kleptocracy. You know that word? That's where those who are in power use their positions of power to steal from the rest of the society. We need to elect folk with real principles. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I'm getting depressed. <laughs> But Paul tells us there's good news. Paul tells us there's good news. And, and you know what? In spite of me making that long, terrible, depressing list, and it could have gotten a lot longer, we are good news people. We are good news people. That's what the gospel is. Good news. And we have some answers. And I'm not meaning that we need to impose our Christian faith on the rest of the society. That doesn't work. It's not helpful. It doesn't accomplish anything. But we do have some answers that we can apply in our own lives and can apply in the larger society. The first thing that we have that is an answer to all of this depression, to all of these problems, is that we know the power of God's love. And we know that God's love overcomes even the power of death. That God's love breaks down the barriers and builds the blessed community that, surprisingly enough, looks an awful lot like the Corinthian church. Because it's made up of people of all backgrounds, of all colors, of all religious backgrounds, of all understandings of the world, of every class, and brought together to make something that is bigger and richer and fuller than any of them could ever experience on their own. We have that. We have a vision of God's shalom based in God's love that says that we don't live in a world of scarcity. We live in a world where there is enough, and there is enough if only we are willing to open our hearts and our hands to one another. We have a vision, a dream in our scriptural tradition of what the world could be when justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream where the love and grace of God changes all of our hearts. 
And second, we have answers because God is at work in us and through us and with us, and God is good. All the time. We know about the tenacity of grace poured out that doesn't let go when things are not what they're supposed to be. We know about the long arc of history that moves towards God's ultimate shalom for all. That grace, grace in the end, will not be denied. And we can see that in our history. It's not easy. It's not quick. We are not perfect people any more than the Corinthians were perfect people. But God is good. All the time. And we can stand in that. There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot to be rebuilt. But we can begin that task. We can be part of that task as we call our sisters and brothers both in the faith and not in the faith to the good work of building the blessed community. And I think Paul would remind us that God is committed through grace poured out into our lives, into the lives of all of those on earth, even those who do not believe and frankly don't have to believe for God to love them. That God is committed to bringing about that blessed community.